from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everyone. I hope you have had an inspiring and fun day at the 15th National Book Festival. I am Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP, which is one of the sponsors of the Fiction Pavilion this year. If you haven't already done so, please take a moment to stop by the AARP exhibit today. You can't miss us. We're the place with the big A downstairs at the book sales shop and the signing lines. This is such a great opportunity for you to learn more about the amazing work that we do at AARP in communities all across this country. And we like what we like to say at AARP, if you don't think loving books when you think about AARP, then you don't know ARP. So we're excited. One of the pleasures I have today is to introduce a great author, Lolita Tatami. I find Lolita's writings particularly intriguing because of the locations and the time sets of her stories mi mirror the South that I grew up in. And she is an amazing storyteller, and I'm looking forward to hearing all about her most recent book, Citizens Creek, a novel. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lolita Tatami back to the National Book Festival. Thank you, Joanne. So I thought that I would, um, I'd start with a reading. Uh, and the reading is from Citizens Creek. This is my third historical novel. Uh, this is the story of uh, basically two people. It is a story of Cow Tom uh, and his granddaughter Rose. They lived in the 1800s uh, and early 1900s. I write multi-generational sagas. Uh, Cow Tom started out as the slave of an American Indian chief of the Creek tribe. Uh, he himself, bought, he bought himself free before the Civil War, and by the end of the Civil War, he had risen in the tribe so that he was himself the first Black Creek Indian chief. And the second part of the book is about his daughter, Rose. So I'm going to read you a passage, and the passage um, is really around the birth of Rose. And Rose was born uh, one of twins, and her uh, male twin did not survive, but she did. And they were so looking forward to having a boy to continue the line. And there was great disappointment that it was only Rose that survived, and the male child died. And Cow Tom's wife is named Amy, just so you know who she is. Cow Tom carried the white muslin bundle through the nutty pasture to a pinch of land he reckoned forevermore would be the family graveyard. Amy followed at his heel. He was oblivious to the ribbed globes turning deep orange on the ground, pumpkin time. His thoughts pulled too tight around loss. Unlike so many others in the tribe, black or red, Cow Tom had yet to bury one of his own here on this stretch of soil along the Canadian River, and that it should be thus, not of starvation or epidemic or someone's natural time, but before life even had a chance to blossom, weighted him like an anvil. The tiny body in his arms was light, shockingly light, a still transient thing, and he tried not to imagine what could have been Edmund. Amy's step was close behind his own. She slid in the mud once, a slippery footfall, but righted herself without going down and carried forward without comment. His arms were full. He couldn't help her. The girl still lives, Cow Tom reminded. Amy didn't answer, yet trudged along after. The family waited on them at the clearing, standing in a circle around the hole Cow Tom dug earlier that morning. Edmund's father, faithful, wore his cloth meeting jacket, but atop his head, slightly askew, was a ceremonial red turban, the soft cotton soiled and fraying along the edges, but majestic nonetheless, 
and draped around his neck on a, rather, on a leather strip, his shell necklace. Faithful did his best to rise to the formality of the occasion, but even standing still, he swayed in place, his head seemingly too heavy for his body, his red eyes blinking against the light, the reek of alcohol escaping from his pores. He carried his old hunting rifle, testing, resting stock down, barrel up at his shoulder, as a military man would on parade. Next to him stood Sarah, filled out and more matronly than in those days so long ago on the Monmouth. Concern deep edged her face like the carvings on Faithful's shell, and she rushed over to throw her arms around Amy's shoulders and lead her into the bosom of their circle. Amy seemed to take comfort. Sarah didn't let go her grasp, and Amy didn't drop Sarah's hand as she took her place by the graveside. Cow Tom knew how Amy would want the ceremony to transpire, full of her own distinct mix of ritual, Creek, and African. He could give her this. He took the lead, placing the form in the hole, laying strips of elm bark over the small body until the white of the cotton muslin was almost lost from view, stealing looks at Amy the while. Still, she seemed not ready, her face rock hard, which he expected, but her spirit too far from his reach, which he did not. After, he motioned to Amy and Faithful, and they each threw in their handful of dirt, the final handshake. The rest of the family members followed, from youngest, barely able to form a credible fistful of dirt, to oldest, Bella, who wept silently, even after her return to Amy's side. When they'd all had their turn, he finished the task, shoveling heaps of earth as cover and packing the soil down with his hands, careful not to stomp on any of the new dirt around the graveside. Amy would accuse him of bringing sickness back to their own house if he had not done such. He'd found three smooth stones, each the size of a winter squash, and placed the markers carefully at the top of the bulging mound, glancing over to Amy's bowed head the while for a sign. Cow Tom had his musket, loaded and ready to fire, and faithful his rifle. The boy would go with the proper send-off. Cow Tom fired the first shot in the air to the north, and faithful, though shaky, fired the second, west. Cow Tom rammed the next load in and shot south. Faithful shot east. Old Turtle watches after the boy now, Cow Tom said. He sought to give Amy a vision, his vision, to make the letting go easier. They'd made their start under Old Turtle's eye. Cow Tom looked again to Amy, hopeful. Amy met his gaze, the struggle plain. He could do no more. She brought her hands together slowly, palm to palm. At first, Cow Tom feared she sought to rid them of the red clinging soil. But she repeated the motion again and then again until with great relief, he knew it to be clapping. Solemn, she picked up the pace and changed the tempo lifting her head. With considerable effort, she smiled. A bit of a disquieting smile, to be sure, laced with stiff and grimace, but born of her clear attempt to appear gay, to conform to her abiding belief in the public banishment of sadness. She stared him down as she continued her, her constant beat, until he too clapped along with her, until he too forced a smile where nothing but hollow lived beneath. When at last she stopped the strange percussion, he knew it time to build the shelter. With stout branches for poles and a canopy of elm bark, he built a little cover over the mound to keep the rain from soaking down in the new dirt, protection until the soul had time to depart. They went back to the teepee then, and Amy scattered some of her medicine around, both inside and out, in the far corners, along the seams of the cowhide, low talking under her breath. She killed the old fire, still usable, 
scattering log and ash in every direction before building another, all new, and only then did she concentrate on Melinda and the baby. No, Melinda said, pushing the baby away. She seeks you, Amy said, and placed the baby girl once more in her mother's arms. No, I want the boy. The girl baby whimpered, searching, prelude to a cry. Amy secured the child and positioned her at Melinda's nipple. The girl is here, not the boy. No use disrespecting fact, said Amy. Her voice had grown stern, the voice of Cow Tom's memory after Old Turtle's funeral when he took to his bed and Amy coaxed him from his dark place. You will mother her, said Amy. Now the mother was weary and unconnected to the girl at her breast, and Amy, who worked with them both, encouraging the baby to suckle and the mother to nourish. Cow Tom, already intruded in this women's business more than natural, made his decision. He never should have allowed the foolishness of the boy's name. They'd gone too far afield of themselves in Edmund. The girl would have a simpler name, a grounded moniker, neither too Indian nor too white. The boy had let go his grasp of the world, but the girl still babbled for her place. Cow Tom appreciated such a spirit. A flower came to his mind, a special flower, able to defend itself, a flower formed. Rose, he proclaimed to the startled household. Her name is Rose. So I, um, I didn't come to writing easy. I came late and I came hard. I uh, had a, an entire career before I turned to writing and I never imagined that I would write one book, let alone three. Um, in the mid 1990s, I left a corporate career behind uh, to find myself and as you can Maybe some of you can imagine, uh, my mother was tremendously disappointed in this notion of finding yourself. She pretty much said, you'd better find yourself a new job. Uh, but I was so interested in our genealogy, the genealogy of my family, uh, the genealogy of those that came before us. I was so interested in the differences between what I knew to be our family stories and the story that is really the mainstream narrative of the South, Gone with the Wind, um, which didn't really reflect any of those people that I knew and the strengths that they had. And I wanted to, I wanted to discover my ancestors in a different way. And I had no intentions of writing about them, I just wanted to find them. And I went on a search. I went on a search, uh, a genealogy search. I knew my great-grandmother's name and I had some family stories of her, Emily. I knew my great-great-grandmother's name, Philomene, even though I didn't really have very many stories of her but I wanted to find one more great out there. And so I began this search that took 18 months. This is after I had quit a corporate job and I had not been working for 18 months. Uh, and I was paying a professional genealogist this entire time to try to find these women in my family and I was paying her by the hour. Uh, at the very time that I was going to give up, and I called and said, I, I have to, I have to, um, I, I can no longer afford to pay you. She said, no, 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 we're so close, we're so close. Um, I will do this pro bono for you, 
That's all she had to say. She didn't need to say anything else. But she said, and, and not only will I do this pro bono for you, because I've never been able to trace a slave family back as far as we have been able to go, and we are so very close. Um, I will do this, and I will get my mother to help me. Again, I was trapped on pro bono, and the fact that her mother was going to help was irrelevant until I found out her mother was the president of the American Genealogy Society. <laughs> and a couple of weeks later, I was holding in my hand a bill of sale of my great, 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 great grandmother who had been sold in 1850 for $800. Uh, and that was such an astounding uh, that was such an astounding discovery that I knew that I wanted to write about it. I wanted to write about the stories of these amazing women that had come before. So I write historical fiction, and I'm often asked, why historical fiction? Why don't you write about something current? Why don't you write a contemporary story? And the official... Uh, nomenclature is historical fiction, but I prefer to call it faction. It's a bit of fact and it's a bit of fiction that makes a story that I think is compelling and allows a reader access in ways that they wouldn't normally have. And the stories that I am drawn to are the stories that are about those things that I did not know I did not know. And so knowing that it takes me three to four years to write a book, it has to be something complex and interesting and surprising all the way through in order to hold my interest so that I can hopefully hold a reader's interest. So I write historical fiction because History is so very often rewritten by the victor. That's the only story that you hear. And Southern history is rewritten by the entitled. So I wanted to write and to give voice to the voiceless. I wanted to give voice to those people who are trying to live everyday lives within a certain context. I seem to be stuck in slavery somehow. There's always a, a reference to it. Even when I start later on, and it's after the Civil War, sometimes there's, there's something that goes back. But I think this is a history uh, of a people, and I think it's a history that we can't afford to leave behind. I think we need to continue to understand how this country was built how this country was made, and we're still wrestling with all of these problems today. And, in, and until we recognize them, I think we will continue to, uh, to wrestle. So the things that I didn't know, that I didn't know before I started writing books, in my first book, Cane River, I was only glancingly aware of, uh, in Louisiana, of a unique place called Cane River uh, where whites, slaves, and free people of color were each their own distinct categories of people. And they coexisted in ways that were peculiar um, and surprising and a bit odd. I didn't realize how much Slaves were the econom economic engine of the South. I thought it was more about land. It was really the value was in the slaves that worked the land. Um, I didn't realize how many side families there were that I was descended from, and these are intact side families. Um, these were white men who had their own white families, but they also had a side family with a black woman, and most of the time that was uh, coerced. Um, but it, they were families that grew up together in, in a very strong family unit. 
And so I explored that in my first book, Cane River. In Red River, which was my second book, um, I didn't really realize, just because I had never been taught this in school, that black men could vote, and not only could vote, but could hold office, and they did in those 10 years after the Civil War ended and during Reconstruction. Um, and there was an incident there in the small town where both of my parents grew up, Colfax, that was called the Colfax Riot. Uh, and this was the black men of the town trying to defend their slate of candidates that were to come in and uh, that they had voted in. Uh, and the uh, white men who had previously ruled refused to vacate. They uh, drove the black men who were protesting into the courthouse, set fire to the courthouse, shot them when they came out. This was a story, according to my aunt, uh, who told me only this. She said, three of your grandfathers, three of your great grandfathers were in that courthouse. Some got out and some didn't. And so it became a great puzzle piece to try to figure out what that story was. And so I wrote that story for Red River. For Citizens Creek, there was such a long list of the things that I did not know. I did not know, for example, that American Indians owned slaves. Uh, starting out for this particular branch of the family, starting out in Alabama, and when the removal by the U.S. government came in the 1830s. The slaves were removed because the U.S. government wanted that land and they were moved into Indian territory. The Indians were allowed to take their possessions with them and that included their slaves. And so along the Trail of Tears, um, there were not only the American Indians but their, their slaves as well. I didn't realize how complicated the inter, uh, inter and intra-tribal politics were within the tribes, how, how the government used one tribe to round up another tribe and drive them along the removal into Indian territory. I didn't realize that black men in the tribes sometimes had a very unique position, a very unique and leveraged position, actually. In some of these tribes, they did not speak English. And in many cases, the US government didn't speak the dialect of the tribe. And many of these black men who had been owned by both black and American Indian spoke both, and they became the interpreters and they helped to negotiate the treaties between these two factions. So that was, that was as translators and interpreters, and that was Cal Tom's way of becoming free, buying his family free, um, and then rising to a position where he was uh, politically a, a tribal chief himself. Um, I also didn't realize that the largest land distribution that the country, this country has known was freedmen of American Indian tribes who were given 160 acres. Now we all heard about 40 acres and a mule that never came, that, that never came to pass after the Civil War. There was talk, it never happened. What did happen was that freedmen who were considered citizens of the Creek tribe and the Cherokee tribe, uh, many of the tribes, um, were actually given 160 acres, man, woman, and child, so that they owned land. They were very quickly cheated out of that land, but the land distribution did take place. So all of these things were, were events that I just did not know even occurred in history, and I wanted to 
write about them, but I wanted to write about them in a very personal way within the context of their families um, and how they brought their families along. Citizens Creek is actually uh, based on a real man. Uh, this is not made up. There really was a, an African Creek chief named Cow Tom, uh, which was shocking to me. Um, and his granddaughter took on the mantle of uh, his independence, and she became a rancher uh, and owned ranch land in Oklahoma herself. This is not my family, but it's somebody's family. Um, so the, st the stories that I'm drawn to are, um, are stories that we don't learn in school. And uh, at least I didn't learn about them in school. And I've talked to very few people who know about these little, little cubby holes in history. I am far more interested in the resilience of people and the construction of families and how we use families um, to withstand the battering of history. Uh, then I am facts or dates, which is why I am, again, particularly drawn to faction. Uh, I think that you can get at truth sometimes far more easily through fiction than you can through uh, something that you footnote and you have to document three different ways. The characters that I'm drawn to and the stories that I want to tell always seem to, seem to be of people that are victimized, but they are never victims. They figure their way through, and they figure their way through not only for themselves, but for their families as well. Um, they are dedicated to bringing their children along. They make difficult choices. They make choices about whether their children should be acculturated or whether they want them to stay within a certain culture. Um, and in each case, the intent is that the next generation will have more than the generation that came before. And that's consistent, uh, and it's based in reality. So I am so thrilled to be able to come and talk about uh, to talk about Citizens Creek. I'm so thrilled that there was that there was a family that rose from nothing, really, from slavery times uh, in the 1800s to producing a child in the early 1900s who became the largest black oil broker uh, in the country. And this was through a series of choices that each generation made. And that's also uh, of, of great interest to me is the choices that one generation makes having so much impact on the next generation and the generation after that and the generation after that, even if those people in that generation don't realize what those connections are. They are connected. So I would love to um, answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and hopefully there is one in the audience here somewhere. Hello. Hi. I wanted to ask about your experience. You said you came to writing late, and you came at it hard. Tell me about your experience as a, an author um, that had some experience, and what the advantages are to being an, that kind of an author. The major advantage uh, to coming to writing late is that I made a living before this. So I had a very full career in the corporate environment before that allowed me the, the time and space I needed to try to develop a craft to be able to write a novel. Um, that is a huge advantage. Uh, I 
was particularly lucky because my first book was selected by Oprah. So um, that relieved a lot of financial pressure. <laughs> but coming to it late also meant that I could appreciate what I knew and what I didn't know. Uh, it meant that I, uh, when, when I would uh, sit down to write, I knew that I had things to say, I just wasn't sure what they were yet. And it gave me more time to find that out. So I could spend a lot of time by myself with, without going off to a job or raising small kids or any of that. Uh, and just try to concentrate on the delivery of a story that I felt was really important. Um, a question to your intriguing exodus from corporate America, <laughs> which is, did your mother live long enough to enjoy your success? Okay, let me tell you a story. <laughs> so, my mother, um, my mother was a shut-in. She had multiple sclerosis, so she was, uh, she was a shut-in. And so we would talk pretty often. When I, uh, but my mother also was very instrumental in getting me through school and, you know, not only undergraduate, but MBA and, you know, on and on. And so every success that I had was a shared success because she felt that that was her promotion in that job as well. It wasn't just mine, it was hers. I did not ask her if I could quit my job. <laughs> I just quit. And so there was a betrayal and there was a lot of pouting for a very long time. And my mother would call me, uh, this is after I started to write. My mother would call and she'd say, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm, I'm writing. I'm right in the middle, I'm writing. And I would hear this just deathly silence and then a very deep, <sighs> okay, fine. And she'd hang up. So uh, she, she was not pulling any punches about how she felt about any of this. So I'm writing and the added insult was that I was writing about our family and our family story. So I was putting our business out in the street <laughs> and I wasn't going, I wasn't interviewing. I wasn't going back to work. I was just working on this, this thing. And then when she found out that it was all the way back to slavery, she was appalled. She was just absolutely positively appalled. But I was determined and I kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. So at the launch of my first book, Cane River, um, my brother told me this story because I was in New York and my brother was her caretaker and you know he described that they were watching TV and they were watching on my launch day on national TV me being interviewed by Brian Gumbel. And my bro according to my brother, she kept looking at the TV <laughs> and you just kind of not quite able to understand what they're asking her questions and he seems like he's interested and <laughs> she's on there and this is and so she was processing she was literally just trying to process this because to her it was just something foolish that I was doing she thought I would grow out of. So the, you know, those interviews last for three, four minutes tops. And um, so, you know, I'm off. And the phone rang almost immediately when I went off the air. And it was the pastor of her church. And he said, Sister Willa Dean, I just saw your daughter being interviewed by Brian Gumbel do you think you could get her to come down and talk at the church? <laughs> and my mother said, that's my child. She'll do anything I tell her to do. <laughs> and after that, 
my mother would call. You know, I came back home. It was time to start another book. I would be right in the middle of, of writing. The phone would ring. I'd pick up the phone, and she'd say, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm writing. Don't let me disturb you. I'll talk to you later. She came around. I have two questions for you. All right. Um, I spent time in Silicon Valley, much like you, about during dot bomb. Um, and I was curious. Uh, so the first question is, do you think that you'll ever write about your experiences out there in corporate America <laughs> uh, and in that uh, very uh, go-go kind of uh, society? The second question is, um, as you were doing and going through the genealogy research, what uh, ancestor or thing that occurred in your family uh, did you identify with as far as your ability to persevere? Two very different questions, and I guarantee you I'll forget one of them by the time I get going. But so the first answer is incredibly easy. Oh, no, I'm not writing about that. The, um, my, my time in Silicon Valley was very, very intense. I was a vice president at a Fortune 500 high-tech company. It was, um, it, was, it was go, 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 as you say. And it, I don't really want to go back and relive that in truth. So I, I'm just not drawn to it. Um, there, there's a, there are a lot of stories there, but for some reason I'm just really not drawn. Um, as in terms of the experiences of, of my characters, th there are so many. In order to write a book, and in order to write a book, my books all take between 14 and 18 drafts before they're done. And, um, and I live through them through every single character. So I try not to make very obvious villains and very obvious heroes. Everybody's flawed. Everybody's just trying to, trying to make it through. Um, but I think that the, I think that in my first book, actually, uh, in Cane River, I identify with one of my ancestors who could not read or write and yet she was the one that accumulated land in Louisiana. She was the one that went to the courthouse and fought to keep that land. She's the one that put the family in a position to have something to build on. And I am so uh, uh, not only appreciative, I, I'm in awe of how she could do that with so few tools. So anytime that I have the nerve to even think that my life is hard. I think back on what she had to do and what she had to put up with, and this is a piece of cake. Um, I really liked your point about you know faction and the narrative having a lot more truth in it sometimes than just the historical like you know narrative in that sense, um, and the idea that going through the narrative can help someone experience it and really understand it in a better way. And I was curious whether you've had a lot of people reach out to you to ex like tell you about their experience and how it helped them see the world differently and really experience it. And, and if you do get a lot of that, what like one of the more interesting responses was? I, I actually do. Um, I get a lot of people. I, I will tell you, when my um, I'm not surprised anymore, but when my first book came out, I expected that maybe it would be um, appealing to African Americans. And what I found as soon as I went out on the road was that I had people coming to me and saying, you know, you're, re you're relating my story. And I would look, and this would be on a signing line, a book signing line, and I'd look up and it would be a man, it would be a Vietnamese woman, it would be an immigrant, it would be somebody outside of that experience. but what they were saying is it's talking about a marginalized voice and putting forward um, with some clarity what that voice is and not only what the obstacles are but what the strategies are to be able to navigate that landscape. 
Uh, and so th that I have had a lot of people say that they identify with characters in these books that I would not expect. Don't you have a curiosity about the lineage of Kyle Tom? I do. <laughs> you mean how he got his name? About his family. About his family. Um, I do have, I had quite a curiosity, as a matter of fact, uh, and I went back as far as I could with fact, um, and I had... So here's one of the things. When you are writing a multi-generational novel, you only have so much real estate to work with. And so you can only go back so far, and you have to keep going forward. So this, this, covers, this covers almost 100 years. Uh, so I went back as far as the naming of Cow Tom on a plantation. Uh, and this was a this was actually a Creek Indians plantation, and he was the guy who, as a boy, he was the guy that took care of the cattle. There was another Tom that took care of the ponies, so he became Cow Tom to differentiate him from the other Tom. Um, beyond that, I don't have fact. And so I moved forward from there. But yes, I'm very interested about all things cow tom. I was interested to know how you prepared to write your first book. Did you go back to school? Did you take classes? Or did you just sit down and write? So please don't try this at home. <laughs> please. Um, I, the, the arrogance that I came to the to this was it's just amazing to me now. Um, I really literally sat down one day and said, I think I'll write a book now. Uh, I had prepared and prepared and prepared and prepared for a life in business. Um, for a life of writing, I did no preparation except to read everything I could get my hands on. Um, and so I was reading all the time, but I had not taken a class, nothing. And what I did is I put myself in the place of the characters that I knew were going to be in the book, and I gave each one a diary. And I would write in the diary every day, this is what I'm going to do today. My name is Suzette. This is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to milk the cow. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I wrote these long, involved diaries. And then I started throwing those characters in rooms together and having them talk to one another. And then I would throw three in a room together and have them talk to one another. And it was just sheer force of will to try to write a book. Thank goodness it turned out all right. I, just, I had a follow-up question from um, the previous question. Um, so how has your writing changed? Has it gotten easier um, with the third book? Has it gotten, you know, do you find you still facing the same challenges? And what happens when you do get stumped? How do you move along? So maybe this isn't true for other authors, although I've heard the same thing. Uh, you lose the recipe in between books. You know, and, and unless you're writing a franchise book, unless you're writing a sequel and a, you know, you just start keeping going, if you're, if you're writing a, a new data kind of book, uh, it's just as hard. It's hard and you can't figure it out. And I thought the second book would be so much easier and the third so much easier than that. And it's, it seems to be the inverse, actually, that's happening. It's getting harder and harder. I do think that the language is getting better and better. Uh, so it's a, um, it's, a, it's a give and take, and I wish it was easy, but it's not, ever. <laughs> yes? Um, most of the history of African Americans in Louisiana is written and it always concentrates or in southern Louisiana, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, et cetera. Thank you so much for bringing Northern Louisiana to the forefront. 
Uh, but I also want to, <laughs> I was, I'm a native of Louisiana and Shreveport. I also want to um, ask you a question because Red River, I want to concentrate on that. That's a very powerful, very beautifully written book. How in ex extensive was your research on the facts of the, of the Colfax uh, riot? Yeah, the, the research for Red River was so unbelievably intense. And I actually uh, charted a three-week period. Of, you had to do a lot of uh, research. I had to do a lot of research just to understand the context in which this, this event emerged. But for the three weeks when it was unfolding and happening and the immediate aftermath, uh, I had it plotted down to the hour, um, every single hour for each one of those three weeks. What happened here, what happened there, when the KKK came in and surrounded the courthouse, each of those I got from, um, from documented fact, but so much about that incident was written uh, again, by the victor, that uh, I had to infer what really happened. Very, very, very little documentation other than that hour by hour um, uh, compilation that I put together. It was a, that was a very tough place to live for the three week, for the three years it took me to write that book. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.